Well, good morning once again. So good to be here. Before the sermon, I'll just give a brief introduction to uh, the ministry that I'm a part of. Um, but so thankful to be worshiping here with you. Um, I love your singing. Uh, I love your worship here. You sing the gospel. You pray the gospel. You preach the gospel. You show the gospel. And so it's, it's very encouraging for me and my family. This is our third time being here. We already feel like we're a part of the family here. Uh, we even have our regular seats. So <laughs> We're just... Uh, Glad to be here. My name is Joel Hollins. My wife is Mary. We've got four kids, Jacob, Annie, Solomon, and ZJ. And um, just so happy to be here with you, worshiping with you. Um, I'm a part of a ministry called Missio Serve Alliance. It's a missionary sending agency. And um, the kind of the division that I'm a part of in that is the church engagement Parts, which we call propempo. Propempo is a Greek word for to send. And so we want to send missionaries well. And that's why I'm here. Part of that ministry here to you is to encourage you and to help you as a church as you're seeking to send missionaries. Um, I've grown up in the Dayton area uh, my whole life, except for 11 years when I was in China. And uh, that's where we met my wife. We got married there. Um, I've spent eight years in pastoral ministry, and now I've been doing this ministry for over a year now, and it's just been a blessing to be a part of it. Um, a big part of my ministry has always been focused on church partnerships and trying to help us all come together. And that's how I met Jamie through the Gospel Coalition, and so, so, so thankful for those connections that we can make. I am raising support for my ministry so that we can do this. Um, it is uh, donor-based um, churches and individuals supporting us. And so I have a few pieces of information on the back table there I want to point you to. Feel free to take any and all of these there, just a business card and then a prayer card. Uh, please pray for us. Um, take one home, put it on your refrigerator so you can remember us. And then there's just a little flyer about a book that we're putting out. Um, it's all about um, what the focus of our ministry is on, that the church is central to missions. So we really want to encourage the church to take up its responsibility to train up and raise up missionaries within the church, to send them out well, and then to continue to shepherd them once they're on the field. That's the responsibility of the church. We don't want to you know, delegate that to somebody else outside. Uh, we really want the church to be doing those roles. Um, in our ministry, we have three basic stages of interaction with the church. Uh, we do evaluation, education, and then what I like to say is elevation, because you have to alliterate. Um, but it's all, it's all about just trying to assess each church is different, and so how can we help you best? How can we encourage you? Is my microphone close enough? Okay, good. I'll just feedback. Um, so anyway, I basically want to say you're not alone. Churches don't have to do it alone. We have help. And so that's why we want to come alongside you and help you to do that. Uh, I do want to give a little bit of an advertisement, if I'm allowed to do that. I think in the middle of June, Lord willing, or July, I'm sorry, I'd like to come back and do a training seminar with your church. And so I'd want to welcome you to be a part of that. Um, I don't know if the dates are officially on the calendar yet, but you'll find out about that soon. So, Lord willing, I hope to come back and be able to interact with you more um, just about what does it mean for your church to be a sending church. Most important, though, in all of that is that God is the one who's doing it. God is the ultimate sender. And how do we know what God wants us to do? We go to His Word, and we trust in His Spirit, and you have those. And so that's why we're here now to hear from His Word, and we're going to do that from Matthew chapter 28 today. So I invite you to turn in your, turn your Bibles to Matthew 28, looking at that familiar passage called the Great Commission, verses 16 
through 20. The difficulty with studying a familiar passage of Scripture is we tend to just nod in agreement and we don't really see it with fresh eyes. And so we need to pray before we read this that the Holy Spirit would do His work in our hearts. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that you have given to us your word. It is sufficient and clear, and it is powerful. We thank you, Lord, that we can now submit to you under it, and we ask that we would be humble before you. I pray that I would be humble now as well, Lord, that we would not be thinking of ourselves, but our eyes would be turned to Jesus Christ. May we all, may I, decrease so that Jesus might increase. And Lord, we pray for your Holy Spirit right now in our midst, in our hearts, to lift us up to heaven, that we might have a vision of your glory, that we would see your design that you've given to us, your plan in your word for people from all over to be worshiping you. Build within our hearts, Lord, a desire to see this come about. Give us the strength by your Spirit that we would work toward this end, because you are worth it. Bless us now as we consider your word. Strengthen us. Fill us with hope and peace and comfort. We thank you, Lord, for your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray this in his name. Amen. Let's read together from Matthew 28, 16 to 20. Here's the word of the Lord. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations." baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Thanks be to God for His Word. It always accomplishes His purposes. Our big idea this morning is a definition of of discipleship. It goes like this. Discipleship is the Christ-commanded and Spirit-empowered equipping of all true Christians everywhere through the church to fully know and obey Jesus. I recognize that's a mouthful. I'll try to do my best to break it down into bite-sized bits for us, but before doing that, I'll give you a really condensed summary of that. Basically, the point is this. Disciples make disciples. Jesus directs his disciples on how to make more disciples. There's one singular command verb in this passage, and that is the command to make disciples. All other words that look like a command, like go and teach and baptize, those are actually what we call participles, which are ing words describing how to make disciples. So we make disciples by going and baptizing and teaching. So the Great Commission gives to us a rather full definition of discipleship. I'll say it again. Discipleship is the Christ-commanded and Spirit-empowered equipping of all true Christians everywhere through the church to fully know and obey Jesus. There are five aspects of this definition of discipleship I'd like to expand on. But before I do, take a quick look at the context of this one singular command in this passage. The context tells us who this command is given to, and it frames how we are going to be able to relate to it as well. The disciples have just spent three extraordinary years following Jesus, watching Him heal and do miracles, and to teach. And then it all culminates in his death and resurrection. And despite his multiple forewarnings, they're still befuddled at this point. 
Even after he has risen from the dead and shown himself to them, they're still missing something. And Jesus has a couple of more things to give to them. They're a mixed bag. They're a mixed bag of both worship and doubt. So verses 16 and 17, and actually the first little bit of verse 18, give us the setting. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them. The first thing we notice is that they are disciples. Jesus had already directed them, and they have obeyed. Going to the mountain, he told them, and they worshipped. But some doubted. Doubt. It's a moment of indecision. It's where you're blown and tossed by the wind, as James 1 tells us. You lack wisdom. You don't know what to do. You need clarity of direction and the determination to do it. It's like if you're a soldier in the fog of war and you don't know which way to fight. And Christians can be this way. In fact, entire churches can be this way. We worship Jesus and we follow Him, and, but sometimes we just don't know what we're supposed to be doing. This is why one of the most significant components of this passage is the simple fact that Jesus came to them And he spoke to them. Jesus does not leave us without direction. We can say the same about our worship services as well. How amazing it is that we can hear Jesus speak to us from his word and give us the direction, especially when we are doubting. We don't know what to do. So do you ever feel lost? Feel like you need a little bit of direction in your life? Do you worship God and yet still feel like, I don't really know what God wants me to do? Last week, we considered Ephesians chapter 3, and we learned about how Christians are encouraged about God's plan for the church. And maybe that excited you, but you're still thinking, how exactly are we supposed to work this out? Well, good news, this passage is for you. I think one of the hardest things about being a parent is letting go. As your children start to grow up, you have to increasingly let go of more things and trusting them with responsibility. I have a 15 and a half year old son. That means I'll soon be handing him some keys and letting go. Not in direct control anymore. My wife and I don't need babysitters anymore. It's great. We can leave the house not too long, give the kids a little bit of instruction, maybe pizza and a movie, and let go. Hopefully, I've given them enough instruction, they know what to do while we're gone. And in a sense, that's where the disciples are now, where we are now as well. Jesus, in Matthew 28, is about to ascend to heaven and leave them and hand them and us the keys to the kingdom. And he's going to give them some instructions while he's gone. He's giving them some responsibility. It's almost unbelievable that he would entrust us with this great responsibility. The ascension of Jesus means that we must abide by his instructions that he has left us with as we await his return, as the bridegroom is going to come back. So what are those instructions? Like we said earlier, the Great Commission is basically one command to make disciples. There are plenty of descriptions here helping us to define what that means. There's five aspects of discipleship in this passage to help those sometimes doubting disciples who don't know what to do. As we go through these, I hope you can see how important the church is to discipleship. Discipleship is what the church does. So the first aspect of discipleship helps us define what it means is the authority of discipleship. As I said in our our description of discipleship, it is Christ-commanded. 
Discipleship must have authority. And that authority is the resurrected Jesus. He says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. And the interesting thing about what he says here is that all authority has been given to him. Which is interesting because Jesus is God and he's always had all authority. But the unique sense of him receiving authority is that he has definitively proven that through his resurrection. Jesus has defeated death and the grave and our sin. And our justification has been once for all accomplished because he has raised from the dead. Jesus has the authority to give to us the same resurrected eternal life because he now sits at the right hand of the Father exercising that authority. The ascension is the picture of Jesus' authority. So where do we see that authority at display in our lives as we seek to make disciples? We see it in the church. We can't have people who are disciples of Jesus who are independent of spiritual authority in their lives. And the only spiritual authority that Jesus has instituted in the lives of his disciples is in his word. And the authority that Jesus' word gives to his under-shepherds, your pastors, is the preaching and teaching of that word. And those under-shepherds cannot go beyond what Scripture says. But be wary of the person who acts as their own authority, who is not accountable to a shepherd in their life, a shepherd who would potentially rebuke them and correct them. And so because authority is an essential element of discipleship, we have to make disciples in the context of the local church. To use Jesus' analogy of that of being a fisher of men, If you want to go out fishing on a lake, you might need the authorization to go fishing, like a fishing license or maybe permission from the owner of that lake. It requires authority. The second aspect of discipleship is the scope of discipleship. We have the authority, and now we have the scope. By scope, I mean who are the people that we are making disciples of? He Here Jesus says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. The scope of discipleship is focused on all nations. And the way I I worded that in our definition I gave you is that we make disciples of all true Christians everywhere. If you want to go fishing, you need to know what you are trying to catch. You're limited in the scope of your hunting endeavor. You throw out your line into the water and you hope to catch a fish, not a badger or a microwave. You're going fishing. So we understand the scope of discipleship by first looking at that word go. How do we make disciples? This is that first participle, that ing word there. We make disciples by going. Going takes initiative. It takes a decision to leave your home, to go and live among a different people. You're not going to make disciples by sitting on your hands and watching TV all day. You've got to get out there and go. Jesus says in John 20, verse 21, As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. The good shepherd leaves the 99 sheep and goes and finds the one lost one. God has first taken initiative in sending His only begotten Son to rescue us, to redeem us. And as that old hymn goes, from heaven He came and sought her to be His holy bride. And just as the Father has sent Jesus, so Jesus is now sending us too. Or as Romans 10 puts it, how can the lost hear? unless someone preaches to them. And how can they preach unless they are sent? Under the Old Covenant, there is what we might say 
a centripetal movement where everything is moving inward. Everyone must come to the temple and worship at the one place that God has chosen for himself. But in the new covenant, there is a centrifugal movement, an outward direction. The church expands and goes out. We don't build it and hope they will come. This is that radical change we talked about last week and how things are now done. Like God has done for us in coming to us, so we must go out into the world where they are and meet them there. If you want to catch some fish, you have to go to the lake. We set the scope of our vision on the lake. We go there. You don't fill a pail full of water and hope the fish are going to jump in. It takes initiative in going. But where do we go? As these verses make clear, we go to all nations. Now, much has been said of this word for all nations there. It's very common to say it's not the geopolitical boundaries of countries in the world that we think of, numbering almost 200. But it's more likely people groups based on culture and language and even geography. But I think it's possible to make another mistake here and maybe take this too far, get too technical about what the word means. The biblical emphasis here, I think, is basically focused on two things. One, it's not just the Jews. It's the Gentiles, too. It's all peoples. And two, the day of Pentecost and the vision of heaven in the book of Revelation focus on this variety of people and their different languages. So, for example, here is that glorious scene we find in Revelation. Revelation 7, 9 through 10 gives us this majestic scene, saying, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. So when you think about the scope of the Great Commission, I want you to remember this vision in the book of Revelation. How glorious, how wonderful it is for us to be among that great multitude and their great diversity as well. And the only way that we can truly celebrate the diversity of many other people is when we are unified in our worship of Jesus. Otherwise, those things are going to continue to divide us. So I summarize this point by saying that we make disciples by going, which is this cross-cultural initiative. This, the scope of discipleship is on all nations. We have authority, we have scope, and the third aspect of discipleship is the beginning of discipleship. This comes from the next ING participle found in verse 19, where it says, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We make disciples by going with a cross-cultural initiative, and we make disciples by baptizing. It's unfortunate that there are many missions and evangelism programs out there where baptism is kind of an afterthought. And I think the reason that baptism is an afterthought is because the church is an afterthought. And even if we don't consider many of those efforts out there that call themselves missions work, but they don't proclaim the gospel, they kind of only do humanitarian work, even aside from these, there's many missionaries who evangelize and preach the gospel and do Bible studies but they don't really have a plan beyond that of what to do with their people. Baptism is an essential component here because it marks off people publicly and identifies them as someone who has placed their faith in Jesus Christ. There's 
there's a bit of formality here. It's the same thing we do with church membership. Baptism initiates a person into church membership. Just read through the book of Acts. People believed, they're baptized, and then their numbers are added to the church. And so I call baptism the beginning of discipleship. If you have professed faith in Jesus as your Savior and your Lord, and you are now repenting of your sins, denying yourself, taking up your cross, and following Him, well, here's the first thing you should do. Get baptized. Jesus very clearly commands those who are His disciples to be baptized. Your baptism shows that Jesus is your Lord and that you are obeying Him. This is the point where I think the necessity of the local church is most obvious. This doesn't make any sense unless you have a church that you're baptizing a person into or a church is being formed. I think it's helpful to notice that this command is not given to the individual to be baptized. It's given to the church to baptize their disciples. People are baptized into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit because they are being baptized into a fellowship of people who uphold the worship of the one true God. In our fishing illustration, this means that we have to call a fish a fish. And we can count them like What's one of the most natural questions you ask a person after they go fishing is, how many fish did you catch? There's something observable and measurable here. If a missionary has been on the field for 20 years and they have never baptized someone, then I believe one of two things is possibly true here. Either they are not actually fishers of men, or... Their pond is empty, and they need to go somewhere else. Baptism is the beginning of discipleship. We have authority, we have the scope, and now we have the beginning. The fourth aspect of discipleship is what I'm calling the end of discipleship, or we might say the goal. If baptism is the beginning, then what's the end? And in one sense, you might say it's, when a person dies or Jesus returns. But it's not exactly what I mean here. What I mean is, as long as a person is alive, how are we making disciples of them? What's our goal and our purpose? And here we have the third ING participle, and it's given to us in verse 20, saying that we make disciples by teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. The goal of discipleship is to teach people to obey Jesus in all of his commands. This is perhaps the aspect of discipleship that most people are familiar with because it constitutes the majority of the time that you spend in discipleship. The elders of the church have a ministry that is largely a teaching ministry. We come to church because we want to be taught. We want to know what God's Word says to us and how it applies to our lives. And what we are taught is not simply a head knowledge. We are taught how to obey Jesus' commands. Jesus, ascended on high, now sitting at the Father's right hand, has left us with sufficient instructions in His Word for how we are to live. And when doubting disciples don't know what to do, we take comfort in the fact that Jesus has spoken to us. He's given to us his words. The waves and the winds of every human-made doctrine may threaten to capsize us, but Jesus beckons us to look at his face and find stability in his word. Jesus has given to us the direction that we need because we have been given everything we need for life and godliness through the knowledge of God in the scriptures. According to 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, Scripture is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. 
any work that we would hope to be pleasing in God's sight, God's Word equips us to do it. The fishing analogy, I think, is a little stretched here. But I suppose it's not too much to say that there is a skill in fishing. We need to learn it. And we are to teach other people how to fish as well. The word I want to focus here on, though, is the word all. It's a pretty important word. It's teaching them to observe all that I have commanded. It means that we never stop learning and growing in obedience. For our entire lives, there is more for us to be discipled in. Whoever you are, no matter what stage of life you're in, no matter what your spiritual maturity is, you have more to learn about God's Word and more that you can grow in your obedience to Him today. We all need to learn again how to obey Jesus. And this is This is why the church is so important. Discipleship is something we do from the cradle to the grave. It's it's not a school where you graduate and get a diploma. It's instead humbly praying and seeking the Lord's guidance on your life again today. Asking every day, Lord, how might I obey you today? And the church is the only place where people who are at every stage of life is asking this question. So your school or your parachurch ministry, that's not designed to be this comprehensive. Only the church is designed to make disciples of all people. What a joy to see. You have all kinds of people here. (laughs) I love to see that you have little babies making all the noise, and that's wonderful. And you've got gray hairs, some with no hairs, and that's wonderful. Praise God for that amazing diversity. We need each other here. We're all in this together. So the end goal of discipleship is teaching all that Jesus has commanded. Now, before we move on to the fifth and final aspect of discipleship, I want to take stock of our hearts for just a moment here. We've heard these first four aspects of discipleship, and the picture is coming to focus. Focus. Discipleship has to do with Jesus' authority, and we make disciples by going, baptizing, and teaching. And we're getting a pretty good idea of what Jesus has commanded his disciples to be busy doing between his ascension and second coming. Jesus has the authority to command us by virtue of his resurrection, and we submit to that authority in the church. And yet, this all makes it seem like a pretty tall order. It's difficult. It's difficult to talk to somebody who is different than you let alone someone who speaks a different language. There's there's this sense of responsibility, this huge weight here that comes with baptizing somebody, especially if you live in a culture where that might get that person ostracized from their family and even killed. People are murdered because they were baptized. And that lifelong teaching of obedience to Christians, young and old, is a daunting task. Obedience is hard. Helping other people to obey, especially when they don't really want to all the time, that might even be harder. We have arrived at the height of our obligation in this point. Jesus expects us to obey everything that he has commanded. Jesus expects us to make disciples by teaching other disciples to obey everything that Jesus has commanded. And I think to myself, everything? Really? Like, why do I have to do 100%? Like, why can't I just get a passing grade? Like, why can't I just do my best and be okay with a few remaining sins? Why can't I just do more good than bad? 
Surely God's going to be reasonable and not expect perfection from me. But no. Jesus expects that I'm going to have to repent of all of my sins and obey Him in everything. I have to take up my cross and deny myself and follow Him. He tells us in John 14, 15, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. You know what that reminds me of? It reminds me of Jesus, after His resurrection, interacting with Peter, cooking fish over a charcoal fire. And He asked Peter three times, Do you love me? And Peter responds with sadness the third time saying, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And how does Jesus respond to him those three times? Then feed my sheep. I get that same sense of sadness that Peter had when I read the Great Commission and Jesus tells me to make disciples by teaching people to obey all that Jesus has commanded. Obedience is hard. We should come to the same conclusion that the Apostle Paul did in 2 Corinthians 2, asking, who is sufficient for these things? That's why I'm so glad for this fifth aspect of discipleship. It's without a doubt the most comforting aspect of all. The fifth aspect of discipleship is the power of discipleship. We need the power of discipleship because we recognize that we do not have the power in ourselves. The power of discipleship is the indwelling Holy Spirit in our lives. Jesus ends the Great Commission this way, And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. It's a very inter interesting thing for Jesus to say because he's just about to leave them. He's going to ascend to heaven and hand them the keys. And so how can he say that he is always with us? Well, he is with us and with them and because the Holy Spirit is in us. So Jesus instructs his disciples just before leaving, saying to them in Acts 1.8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That's a promise. We will be his witnesses here and there and everywhere. And we will do that through the power of the Holy Spirit in us. We will do that. Two weeks ago, Pastor Stephen preached to you from John 14. And he referenced a verse from that, we referenced that verse a little bit earlier. I want you to hear what comes next, though. Because nothing makes this point better than Scripture does. So after Jesus says in John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. He then says this. I'm going to read an extended part of John 14, Verses 15 through 31. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more. But you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. In that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, 
And my Father will love him, and he and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I am going away, and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced, because I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it takes place, so that when it does take place, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you. For the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me, but I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. There it is again, that Trinitarian love. And that great mystery of our inclusion into the family of God. Experiencing that love. The Father loves the Son, and the Son loves the Father, and the world knows about the unity of the Father and the Son because they see Christians obeying. But those commands do not crush us under the weight of obligation and duty. We are freed because of this wonderful promise that Jesus has given to his disciples. He said, you should rejoice that I'm leaving you. He promises to us, but I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. God will make his home with us. Our comfort comes from the promise that Jesus has said, the Helper, the Spirit of Truth, the One who teaches us to remember all that Jesus has said, He is coming to us. And when Jesus leaves earth, He gives to us this peace so that our hearts are not troubled and we're not afraid anymore. We have peace that Jesus has accomplished on the cross. We have that peace And we have that peace now applied to us by the Holy Spirit in our lives. Before Jesus ascended to heaven, He promised to give us two things. One, He has given to us His Word. He has commanded us about how we are to live. We have that spiritual food that we need to be eating. We consider that last week from Ephesians 3. The mystery has now been revealed about how God would have the gospel of His grace organized in the church. We've been told clearly what God would have us be doing now before Jesus returns. And the second thing that Jesus has given to us is His Spirit. We have His Word and His Spirit. We know what we're supposed to be doing and we've also been given the power to do it. This is why prayer is a primary application, just as we saw last week. We need that help. We need the helper. This is why the present ministry of Jesus in your life now is that we pray in Jesus' name. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us. He's hearing our prayers, bringing those requests to God, and we should be confident that He hears our prayers. Because Jesus has raised from the dead, and all authority in heaven and earth has been given to Him, and so we can ask Him whatever we want in Jesus' name and according to His will, and He will hear us. And we pray Like we did last week, we pray for spiritual strength. We pray for that Holy Spirit in our lives. Does the task seem impossible to you? It should. 
Because it is for you, for me. We can't do it in our own strength. But God can, by His Holy Spirit and His power that can raise the dead, He can do anything. We cannot be fishers of men in our own strength. We cannot affect the new birth of regeneration of people's hearts. Like Nicodemus had something right in his disbelief. How can one be born again? How is it possible that we are going to go to a people who speak a different language than us, who think differently and act differently than us, and they eat some weird food? And How are we going to penetrate the darkness of generations of spiritual deception in false religions? How are we going to have the boldness to call them out of everything that they ever knew to be true and believe the words of Scripture that we give to them? How can we have any confidence that someone would give up their former way of life, repent of their sins, be publicly identified with Jesus through baptism, possibly experiencing the backlash and rejection of their neighbors, family, and friends, how can we expect that they would learn instead to obey Jesus and everything that is taught us? This is impossible for us, but not impossible for God. Our comfort and confidence comes from the power of the Holy Spirit. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead now awakens spiritually dead people to new life in Christ. As Jesus has saved you and made you to be a disciple, so he will use you to make more disciples. If he could save you, then he can save your neighbor and the person on the other side of the world. Discipleship is the Christ-commanded and Spirit-empowered equipping of all true Christians everywhere through the church to fully know and obey Jesus. And how wonderful it is to have that resurrected and ascended Jesus on His throne. How encouraging it is for doubting Christians like us to be given clear direction from Him, to know the task that He has given to us, to make disciples of all people everywhere by going baptizing and teaching them. How comforting and empowering it is for us to have the Holy Spirit filling us, equipping us, and strengthening us for this task. And so may God's people be ever dependent on Him in prayer for our every need. Now to Him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, To Him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray in response. Prayer of confession. Our Father in heaven, we confess again our fears and our doubts. Though we worship you, sometimes we doubt. Forgive us, Lord, for being timid with preaching the gospel, for saying that we believe the gospel, but denying it with our actions. Forgive us for not loving others enough to tell them the truth. Lord, we know that you are good. We know that you are perfect and holy, yet we're prone to not believe you sometimes. Lord, we believe, help our unbelief. Remove doubt and wandering and fickleness from our lives. Forgive us, Lord, for trusting in ourselves rather than you. Forgive us for doubting your word and its perfect clarity and sufficiency for us. Forgive us for being disinterested in your word, even bored with it. So, Lord, please Renew our spirits. Make us come alive by the resurrection power of your Holy Spirit. Give us this fervency and zeal for your name and your holiness. Give us those ears to hear as Jesus is speaking to us and turn our attention away from those worthless things. Show us the glory and beauty of Jesus so that we praise his name alone. Give us confidence and hope 
in him as we trust the promise of the gospel. Lord, we thank you for this peace that we have in following you. Give us boldness in preaching the gospel and boldness in going into all the earth. We thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit. pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we confess our sins, we also confess the gospel. So hear now this assurance of pardon from Psalm 103, verses 11 through 12. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love to th- toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Amen. And may God be glorified.